Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, today's robotics speaker, I think, is the last one of the semester, so you are a grand finale. Um, this is Professor Stephen Guy. Is it Guy? Guy. Um, and he is associate professor at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. Um, his work uh, deals in Okay, sorry. The development of artificial intelligence for using computer simulations and for autonomous robotics. Um, he is the vice chair of the board of directors for Chance, which is a nonprofit that focuses on empowering diversified tools for human developers and creators. Um, he's done a lot of work on simulating human vir or, sorry, virtual humans. Um, it's been covered a lot in popular reading papers, and documentaries, um, and late in the I guess that was that question. Um, and then prior to joining this study, he actually got his PhD with our fabulous Dr. Jeanette Morsha. And, and, um, and Minglin Puglia. And Minglin Puglia, yes. Um, so, what? This is quite a, uh, a duel between having uh, the two advisors. I, I highly recommend it. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> uh, th thank you so much. Read between the lines. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me here. I actually um, went to high school on the other side of the river in Northern Virginia. So. It feels like coming back home. My family still lives around in the area, so this is still this is my first time in the University of Maryland. It was really nice to kind of see the campus and walk around the, the engineering side. I've had a lot of fun this morning. Um, I want to talk about modern challenges in motion planning for autonomous robots. So really, I'm going to talk a little bit more broadly about autonomous agents. Anything that's thinking for itself. You, you heard from the introduction. I thought a lot too about how we can apply the ideas from robotics to things like VR or video games or other kind of interactive systems that have similar challenge to robotics. Um, first, I should tell you, I'm from the University of Minnesota, and the university is, uh, kind of has this Midwest nice thing going on, and they do a very j bad job of talking about how great and awesome they are. And so this is what the weather looks like. It's wonderful. Everybody should come visit me up there. Okay, maybe right now it looks a little bit more like this, uh, so I'm glad to be here. I'm not going to lie. But it, it is... Uh, uh, you know, it's a fun and different, interesting environment, so everybody should make a pilgrimage out to the cold north and visit us at least once. Um, so what I research up there in, in the winter and, you know, inside is thinking about how, to, how robots and how agents can think about the world around them, how can plan around the world outside, how can we, um, you know, avoid obstacles, make interesting, intelligent decisions, how can we simulate and understand humans, in, in general, how can we be intelligent artificially. So this is somehow some AI research. Um, before I get too deep in the top talk, I wanted to pause and I'm using the word I a lot, but this is not just me. This is work obviously with lots of collaborators from um, uh, my, my former postdoc is now at Clemson, my medical collaborators, I have a physicist collaborator. Um, the names are underlined are the ones that have done kind of the work that I'm most going to be highlighting today. Uh, Julio up there on the top is Starred. He was my student when he, most of the work started. Now he himself is a professor at the University of Concepcion in Chile. Um, so I mentioned I'm thinking about myself as an AI researcher, AI applied to planning and robotics. Um, and I always worry when I tell people intelligence, they're thinking like word puzzles and problems and bad memes from uh, uh, social media with, with weird grammar. But, but that's not what I, what I mean with intelligence. I mean thinking about how people behave, how to interact with other humans, how to, to, to think about the world around us in an interesting fashion. Um, so that my work kind of gets dichotomized into two areas. Part of it is thinking about how we can model humans effectively, and part of it is thinking about how we can use simulation to improve robots. And of course, you'll see an obvious overlap there, where we use our models of humans to better simulate robots interacting with them. So let me take you know, just a few minutes to talk about some pure human modeling, and then I'll save the bulk of the talk for robotics. And I mentioned this one because I think it gives you a good idea of how I approach modeling humans. And uh, this is actually some, a project that a little bit fell in my lap. I, had a, uh, I got a call one day or an email from a, a, a facial plastic surgeon who knew I did work in human simulation. And she said, oh, I know you do a lot of navigation. Can you do face modeling? And I thought a little bit, and I realized we can apply a lot of the same technologies of understanding, just basic ideas of understanding human motion, to the motion of the face. So we used a game engine. It's called the Unity Game Engine. We had a computer model. What's great about a computer model is that we can make the facial animation as precise as possible. So we have this model, we can exactly put parts of the face where we want it to, and we, we put together a study on a tablet that had animated smiles that were carefully controlled, and we did large-scale data collection. Um, we actually went to the Minneapolis State Fair, so there was some, uh, I think, 2,000 participants that did our study. As far as we know, it was the largest ever study on facial uh, analysis of facial motion. 
Um, and then we do some statistical analysis, and we have a, uh, in this case, we're working with a statistician who suggested a non-parametric mixed effects regression. And what we found from this technique is that there wasn't just one particular uh, smile. There's a whole diversity of smiles. As long as you had some sort of balance of how many teeth were shown, how, how your lips were angled, you had an effective response. There, there was, so I think there's something nice and satisfying about humans. There's no one right thing, right? There's a diversity of good ideas. And I think that kind of illustrates what's hard about understanding humans, is there's not typically one thing humans do. There's different things we do, and we need to think about different tools, technologies, and statistical methods for capturing, simulating, and understanding human behavior. Um, so yeah, I mentioned my, in the bio my work was on late night. So it was actually, I, the next day after this work was published in PLOS, a friend forwarded me a clip of Seth Meyers making fun of uh, that telling somebody they have a pleasing balance of teeth is not a, a particularly enjoyable compliment to receive. I think maybe he called it creepy. But it's a scientifically accurate compliment. Um, so, so this is the idea. This is the approach we're going to take. This is how, how we're going to think about modeling humans. Um, so when we're modeling humans, though, we're not modeling them normally in isolation, at least in my work. We want to model or think about them for what we can extract about that knowledge to make our robots behave better on their own or to make our robots behave better in the presence of other people. Um, so you kind of th you can think, I think about motion planning as a stack, as a series of kind of planning decisions that a robot makes um, at various levels. So the kind of first lowest level in the stack is this immediate collision response. I have a, a millisecond or less, I need to do something right now. And uh, I'll talk about kind of the normal potential force-based techniques and what I think is a better alternative. And we can go up the stack a little bit and we can think about uh, planning over maybe not one millisecond, but 10 milliseconds or a few hundred milliseconds and do something that's more learning or more adaptive. And finally, depending if there's time at the end, I may talk about the well, long-term planning. I have many seconds or even minutes. How can I set my goals, coordinate my goals with the, ro with the other robots around me? Um, but I want to focus on, on collision avoidance for maybe the first half of the talk because I think that's where we as roboticists have the most to learn from how humans do this and how humans do this so well. Um, so I know this is kind of a, an interdisciplinary group, but in uh, my background in computer science, we saw um, there's been a, lots of different ways where people have tackled the problem of multiple robots or multiple agents working together. Uh, where I think I've seen some of the, so, so there's a potential field method to robotics say, and this works in a very physically inspired approach. You'll have uh, one robot, he has a force that attracts him to the goal, maybe it's a doorway, and if there's nobody else around, it'll pull the robot towards, towards, towards the goal as you increment the force. If there's some obstacles around me, you'll have a force that pushes me away from the obstacle. And this works really well in kind of static environments. Um, but when you have multiple robots working together, it can lead to, to uh, kind of jitteriness, to problems with motion. It can even cause robots to, cause, to, to collide with each other. Um, and that's because we're not accounting for velocity, which leads to issues in dense scenarios. And a really clever solution was to try to correct your velocity when you get close to somebody to match your neighbor's velocity. And this was proposed by Reynolds in the 80s, and it leads to this beautiful herding behavior, which is great if you're trying to simulate herds of animals like he did. But it's not kind of what humans do. If we try the same scenario on humans, we get, I don't know, maybe a zombie simulator? <laughs> Again, if, I, if I'm hired by Hollywood to do zombie simulation, I'm set. But if I'm trying to extract what makes human motion so good and use it on robots, to slowly adapt my velocity to match my neighbors isn't to the right strategy. Um, and so this is what my PhD work with, uh, with Ming and Dinesh was focused on, was trying to understand how we can have anticipation, how we can have agents that look into the future, but still provide robust mathematical guarantees of collision avoidance. Uh, so the work we developed was um, kind of three or four different things, but the kind of final one that gave us the best uh, performance is what's known as optimal reciprocal collision avoidance. There was a, a Guy Linden Minocha paper and a Vandenberg Linden Minocha paper that finally got merged into a Vandenberg Guy Linden Minocha that has everything, all, all the best of it together. And the, at a very high level, the idea is if I don't want to run into somebody, I can think about this geometrically in terms of a cone. If my velocity goes far enough to the right of them or far enough to the left of them, I won't collide. So I make a cone uh, in terms of my velocity space. So it's a veloc cone of velocities. And as long as I choose a velocity outside this cone, I'm guaranteed to be collision-free. If there's multiple agents, there's multiple cones. I just stay outside of all the cones. 
It turns out this leads to what's called the conic programming problem, which is hard to do efficiently. So we approximate the cones as a line. Uh, but so it's just kind of the side of a cone. And so we can see an example here. This red agent wants to get to that red goal, but his velocity, shown in white, is going to be colliding with a green or a blue agent if he took his preferred velocity. So the blue line is the set of velocities that are OK that will be collision-free with the blue agent. The green line are the set of velocities that will be collision-free with the green agent. And so we take that black line, that black velocity that's outside the set of, ever, of the forbidden velocity. So all the agents are doing the exact same collision avoidance algorithm, and they perfectly avoid each other. It's nice mathematical guarantees of collision avoidance. And I was really proud of this work. And it was used by both ourselves during my PhD work and by other researchers. I think my favorite version of this is there's an extension at the uh, Museum of Mathematics in New York where they implemented uh, a slightly enhanced version of ORCA. And you can put on a vest, and you can be one of the ORCA agents and walk around in the museum. So if anybody's in New York, they, should, they could go be a, a part of the ORCA swarm. And you can extend ORCA. It's, it's a technique as long as you can think about how to geometrically represent in velocity space different kinds of constraints. You can just, you know, we have our funny constraint shape. This is, in this case, it's a special kind of robot that's oriented. It can only travel in the direction it's facing. And so instead of a cone, you get this kind of funny shape. But we take a linear approximation to it, we put it in the same ORCA framework, and we get this nice smooth collision avoidance. So ORCA works really well. ORCA is very popular. Why, why didn't I just stop there and leave well, leave well enough alone? Well, it has issues. There, there, there are limitations in how it can be applied. Um, so it turns out guaranteeing collision avoidance isn't always what you want. There's more to life than guaranteeing not to run into somebody. And my favorite example of here is we see one robot trying to come this way, and the other two trying to swap places go over there. So if you think about it for a second, what would you do as a human as that one robot? Probably go down the middle, make sure I don't run into somebody. Well, what happens with Orca? He's afraid to move forward. I can't veer left or right because either of them collide. But I can't go forward because that's also going to collide. Because it's making this binary decision, collision or not collision, it gets stuck. It gets afraid to do anything. It gets even worse here. So now we have 10 ORCA agents coming down and one ORCA agent coming up. I don't know what you would do, but I'm guessing it's not this. <laughs> um, right, so we, we have mathematically, just because we have mathematically guaranteed collision avoidance, doesn't mean we have the behavior we're hoping to see. Right? None of our proofs are wrong. None of the derivations are wrong. But there are situations where the behavior can be limited. Um, so I mentioned we know what can do this already well, and it's humans, us. Humans in those scenarios are going to do a lot better navigation than either of those instances. So what can we learn from humans? How do humans do it? And then let's put that on robots. So you know, we've done lots of AI optimal control learning kinds of things for humans. But I really wanted to take a statistics-based approach, where we looked at data sets and tried to find and describe them statistically. It's the exact same paradigm that we used for the facial animation of the, the smile analysis task. So we live in surveillance state. It's easy to find trajectories of people. We gather these trajectory data, and we perform a statistical analysis on them to extract whatever salient patterns in underlying human motion. And once we have that, we can use these, this analysis to create generative models that we can use as our crowd simulations or as models for multi-agent navigation. And you can see here they do these nice things like they slow down in bottlenecks, they arch around um, openings, they have emergent dynamic lanes that form in, bi in bidirectional navigation. So the question is kind of this middle part. What's the statistical analysis which led us to these insights? OK, so I, I kind of want to take a minute to talk about this, because I hadn't seen this tool before I started working with uh, our physicist collaborator from MIT. And he pointed out something called a pair distribution function. Has anybody heard of a pair distribution function or a self-correlation function? OK, so I hadn't either. Um, and it's really, I think, the right tool for the job when you have complex collection of agents that are all interacting with each other independently. So the, the high-level idea is we have some distribution that we're observing in our data set. And we have some other distribution, which is what you'd expect by random. So for a physicist, the observed distribution might be a collection of particles in a gas. And the random distribution would just be whatever if completely mathematical random. And we're going to compare the observed distribution to a random one. So 
what, what difference do you see between these two distributions here? I teach. I'm used to long silences. It's not going to intimidate me. Do you think the spacing on the right looks exactly like the spacing on the distribution on the left? No. no. So it's different? Yeah, so there's more closer ones on the left. If we look at kind of long range distances with completely random distribution of agents, we see long range distances. And when our actual data set, we see some long range distances. Kind of medium range distances happen with the agents on the left, and they happen in their actual observed data. But these short distances, agents that are really next to each other, you would get by a random distribution. But that never happens in our actual observed data. We never see two agents that are standing so close that they're almost touching. So this is a difference between the distribution that we observed and what you'd expect by just randomly scattering agents on the floor. So we take those distributions and we compute the ratio of those. And so if we divide through here, we'll see that when their distance is large, more than whatever, two units, it's basically one. The observed distribution and the random distribution are identical. But when agents are close by, or when these particles are close by, we drop, the, the ratio drops to close to zero. It happens much less likely with this observed distribution than the random distribution. OK, so, so this is how the particle physics things work. We can use this to understand how particles interact with each other. Um, Boltzmann had this, so the turn of the century physicist had, had specialized in statistical mechanics, had this great idea that if you know the distribution, you can actually figure out the energy a particle feels, which might, for a human might be a discomfort. You can figure out how much a particle or a person doesn't like being in a scenario. So if your pair distribution function is one, that means there's no energy, you're okay with this, right? This is something that, that's not bothering you, not trying to avoid. So, and if you're, if it's zero, that means it's something that's really bad and we want to avoid. And I don't, I, I don't promise to know all the statistical mechanics that underlies the derivation, but the final equation makes sense to me. You take the inverse one over this, and then you take the log of that. So the inverse sends zero to infinity, the log sends one to zero. So it's kind of like you flip this down and you stretch it out a little bit, and we can go from some observation of how likely things are as compared to random, and from there we can extract directly out an energy, and the energy can give us a force. So, okay, my physicist uh, collaborator explained this to me. He was really excited. He said, Stephen, the whole field of crowd simulation is going to, you know, has just been missing out in the pair distribution function. Let's try this on real data. So we try it on real data, and, you know, we, we kind of break up our data set into different bins, and we want to make sure all of the bins produce the same pair distribution function, the same force, or else that means we're missing something. So here's the bins of agents that were moving fairly quickly. And we see kind of that graph you'd expect. Nobody is close to each other, and then it kind of trends off towards one. If you looked at agents that were moving a little bit slower, okay, the bins of the data don't exactly line up, but it, they're pretty close. They're maybe within some statistical noise. And if we look at the last bin of data, which is agents that were moving even slower still, oh, it's, it's nothing like the other two. Right? There's a real behavioral dis difference depending on how similar you're moving to the people around you. And maybe this is obvious to you as a human, but it's not there in most of the literature of animating or simulating people, is that human interaction depends on more than just distance. It depends on, at the very least, the velocity of people around you. If you're walking next to somebody very close, but they have a very similar velocity, you're not worried about them. But if somebody's far away and they start coming at you at a high speed, it's a little bit concerning, right? We need to think about more than just distances. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion, and what we finally settled on is instead of distances being in meters, we'll try to measure some distance in time. We'll think about how many seconds people are apart from interacting. So what we looked at is the time to collision. How long would it take if we extrapolate our current velocities, our current controls, until the two agents were to collide or interact with each other? Um, so we redo the same thing, but our x-axis has changed, and now it's time to collision. And no matter how we bend the data, we get the same result. We get the same distribution. We get the same energy. So this is really the kind of big important finding of this work was that we can well model the distribution. We can well model the energy that people feel just by thinking about the time between this rather than the distance. Um, so we do the same Boltzmann trick. We take one over the distribution function and take the log of it. And uh, this is our data bend again a different way. Uh, if you put this in a log-log space, you see that they lie actually 
exactly on the line y equals negative 2x. Uh, so that means that the energy you feel is, is time to the negative 2. It's tau to the uh, k over tau squared. Right, so this was really nice that everything fit on an integer. There's no reason to expect it to be an integer. This could have been 1.3, but it's, it's nicer and simpler to write that it's exactly 2. Um, so this is the key insight, is that humans care not about distances, or not primarily about distances, but they care about the time to interaction with each other. And it goes up in this power law fashion. If somebody is two seconds away from you, that's much, much, or two seconds away from colliding with you, that's much, much less worrying than if they're a quarter second away from colliding with you, right? This, this function steeply gets higher as somebody gets closer and closer to you in terms of time. Okay, so this is the idea. How can we use it in, to create a simulation to control a robot? Well, we need to convert that energy to a force. So the first thing we do is we take the derivative of 1 over time to TTC uh, with respect to your position or your velocity to give you a force. And then we also need a goal-driven force. So we use the same idea of a force that just pulls you to the goal. Um, and you can put this together. It's very simple to code. If you don't believe me, the code's online. You can go to our website and download the Python or C++ versions of it. Um, there is a con in that because our integration scheme is very simple, you need to use very small time steps. So uh, I have the star here to remind me that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this. There's a little bit of a fix you can do to maybe use larger time steps. But for the most part, this isn't a problem. The code's fast enough that you can take several time steps while you're doing your integration, and, and it's okay. Um, so yeah, so here's the system together in a complex environment. All these agents are interacting with each other based off of this power law equation, just 1 over TTC squared. Um, and they're avoiding collisions. They're waiting for each other. They're handling these dense environments. And everything's going smoothly and fairly human-like. So this was a pretty, we were pretty happy with these results. Um, oh, yeah, I mentioned that the code was pretty simple. So uh, for fun, I tried to see how simple I could get it if I could fit it entirely on my business card. I think this is 700 characters. And this includes a vector library, computing the time to collision and its derivative. You can see my integration here. You know, you take the times dt. I, I don't have a vector minus, so I'm like multiplying by negative dt to save some characters. But um, actually, after I did this, I realized this was kind of a boring simulation because you can't visualize anything. And I had some white space left in my business card. So I, I shrunk the font down, a little squeezed. Um, so um, this writes out, uh, this rasterizes to an image, so it does, figures out where the circles are and turns them a random color based on the circle. This outputs a header for an animated GIF, so, so actually if you get a copy of my business card and, and type it in and run it, the output is the binary stream for an animated GIF. So this is, you know, obviously you won't remember the whole animated GIF, but hopefully you remember that this is really, really simple code, and I could fit this and the rest of it all in the business card. Um, so, so this is the idea. This is what we learned, and it's something that really excited the broader scientific community because of the insight it had on humans. It was most of the citations we've had in the paper in the past three years have been outside of computer science. It was accepted in uh, a physics journal, and they actually put it on the cover, which was, uh, which was very exciting for us, and there was a lot of press coverage about the work. But we, as roboticists, don't care about, I mean, we do care about insights from humans, but we care also about the accuracy of this, as the models we're learning really capturing what humans are doing. Um, and so today, or maybe 12 hours ago, uh, my, my co-author on this work, uh, Giannis Kermosis, was presenting um, our new findings, our new techniques for validating simulation accuracy at SIGGRAPH Asia in Tokyo. Um, so, so this is a slide from that talk, uh, where what we did is we looked at a statistical estimation of how likely, given a simulation model, how likely sort of is an observed data set to happen? So it's like a maximum likelihood estimator that we apply for every simulated agent for every time step. So when the, the color is red, that means it was very unlikely that our simulation was had, had a lot of noise introduced to the simulation to reproduce that observation. And when it's green or blue, it meant it was very likely. So if we use these kind of distance-based potentials, we can see a lot of red and orange, meaning it didn't match the human trajectory as well. If we looked at that, the, the work I did uh, with Tinesh during my PhD, there's actually substantial improvement. It matches much better. But the power law itself, this kind of TTC-based forces approach, matches better still. It's really, in some true sense, capturing this human behavior. 
And if we go back to our thought experiment, or actually real experiment, where we saw Orca fail and was too afraid, uh, TTC does much better. We go confidently forward, and the collision resolves itself. Or the, the situation resolves itself without collision. So I'll talk about extensions in a second. Are there any questions about the high-level idea? Simulation with all the people walking around in the maze and they're all trying to get out and everyone's wearing different colored shirts. How did you uh, take into account the obstacles of the walls? So the walls are treated like, so there's two things. One is the wall is treated like a static agent, so an agent that's still without a velocity. Uh, we tried just putting a bunch of circles literally for the walls. That works okay, but eventually we, we did the math for a, a wall itself. You can compute the time to collision with a wall. But you also need a... A guiding plan, right? You can't walk straight towards your goal. So we have a uh, road map, a probabilistic road map that agents use to plan a star around that gets you out of the building. Thank you. That's a great question. And here I assume all the agents are col uh, collaborative and they're trying to do the same algorithm. I mean, TTC doesn't assume, so the question was, are you assuming the agents are collaborative? TTC doesn't assume anything, right? We just saw the statistical trend and we implemented the statistical trend, right? Th there's no assumption on top of that. Malicious agents that are trying to hit you. So if some malicious agent was trying to hit me, what's going to happen is that my, the, the power law is going to go up, right? My t if you were running at me, that TTC is going to get very high, right? And so I will start running naturally. But there's no, like, game theory built into it, right? This is just the dynamics of the law that came out. These are great questions. Okay, so, so one thing I promised to come back to is this notion of needing very small time steps to update my simulation. Um, and there's some reasons for this, but mainly it's because we're using Eulerian integration, which is known to have this problem in a variety of, of scenarios. Anytime you're trying to solve an ODE with Eulerian integration, you need small time steps. And there's a variety of better ODE solvers. Uh, the ones we pursued here were uh, of a class called implicit solvers, where you look at not the derivative where you're standing, you look at what the derivative will be after you apply the update from that derivative. So you get kind of the circular system that leads to some... Um, uh, some system of equations that you solve, you can do it, but it all assumes that your energy is smooth. And if we think about this two-agent scenario, if there's an agent I'm trying to avoid, to the left or to the right, if I go far enough away, I'm outside of any sort of time to collision. I'm not on a collision course, so there's zero energy. And I can discontinuously hop to high energy by just making a small change to my velocity. So this discontinuity is preventing a lot of uh, large classes of better um, integration schemes from being applied to our system. And uh, what we did to, to help alleviate this was you just blur it. So if you take your, your energy function, you apply a, a essentially a Gaussian blur, you, to, you remove this discontinuity, and now we can optimize over this energy function with a better solver. Um, there's a second problem in that we're also assuming, or, or techniques for this typically assume, that you have uh, your, your energy function is only dependent on relative positions. But because we're computing time to collision, your velocity is important as well. So we, we do an optimization-based formulation that accounts for both positions and uh, velocities. And the end result of this is that rather than having a one millisecond time step, you can have 100 milliseconds or 400 milliseconds or even 1,000 milliseconds, right? So here in this third video, agents are changing their velocity only once a second. And you still have essentially the exact same paths that we took with this hyper-frequent update. Um, at some point, it breaks down, right? If we only let agents change their velocity once every four seconds, they essentially have to slow down to avoid collisions. But you really have this much larger range of stability for your, um, your forced-based navigation now. And what makes it s this happen is that we're thinking about velocities, and we're trying to extract the algorithms that was baked into humans, and it works very well. Uh, second kind of thing I wanted to mention is uh, when we're computing these forces, we're kind of assuming that we have a completely holonomic system, that our agents can take any velocity they want. Um, and that's not true for most robots. You have some sort of constraints. If you think about maybe a, a differential drive robot like a tank or a Roomba, I can t change my angle arbitrarily and I can change my speed arbitrarily, but I can't say strafe left or right. I have to turn or move forward. Um, so something we're working on literally right now is rather than, than looking at the derivative of the energy with respect to your position or velocity, we can compute the derivative with respect to an arbitrary control to U, whatever dynamics your robot has. Um, so you can't, do, okay, you can't do this for arbitrary dynamics, but 
uh, the trick we've been kind of playing with right now is called implicit differentiation, where we compute this controls assuming you know the time to collision tau. So you can have a closed form, a closed form solution conditioned on knowing the point where two agents collide. And then you can do a forward simulation with something like a Runge cutter to figure out at what point the collision would happen, and you plug that back into your DE, DDU. And now you have a gradient that you can optimize. It's still discontinuous, but there's ways to get around that. Um, and what's nice now is that we can have a TTC-inspired update rule that can work on robots with holonomic constraints. Uh, so on the left here, you're going to see uh, a differential drive version of ORCA. I think if you download ORCA from ROS, this is what you'll get. Um, and you get the classic ORCA problem. When a constrained scenario, the agent has no one path it can take that won't cause some collision, so it has to go backwards. But we have our differential drive version of TTC. Um, it's not going to be as smooth as in simulation, but everybody goes forward. And once we get to a point where we can't go forward more without causing problems, we stop and wait, and then continue much more smoothly and efficiently. This is real time. Go through real time. Um, uh, there's no priorities. Um, I'll, I'll show you a version in a second that has priorities. But there, it's just this one over TC, one over TTC law, but where we redo the derivative in the space of the controllers. Um, yeah, I think I try to. I'm harping on this just because I'm so surprised how well it works. Right? I think there's something that's really good about. What's the algorithm that's baked into humans that's really effective, and I think we're getting a lot of mileage from trying to port it as well as possible to robotic systems and similar kinds of settings. Okay, so let me talk about this kind of second level here of let's not just immediately react to the velocities around us. Maybe we can do something a little bit better. Maybe we can choose our goal velocity a little bit better. And I showed you the second failure case of ORCA. Um, well, TTC does maybe better here. Um, maybe not. <laughs> we just plow straight ahead. Uh, and, and we're right. The other agents get out of our way eventually. But this is probably not the behavior real humans would do. And you can think about why. You can argue about why. But to me, I feel like this is a problem of what we asked from TTC. We told it you want to go straight ahead. And so it went straight ahead as well as it could without causing collisions. Um, really, we should give it the flexibility to choose different preferred velocities on the way to reaching its goal. And one way to formulate this problem is as a bandit knowledge problem, as a knowledge, as a, we have an option of different preferred velocities we can take. And we're going to choose, we're going to explore different preferred velocities, and we're going to choose ones that are effective. So our agent will choose a preferred velocity, move a little bit in that direction, and if it causes problems, they're going to downweight that velocity and maybe try a different one. Um, and so bandit learning is something that's been very well studied. Um, and you just kind of give it a reward function, you can use classical bandit optimization techniques. So the reward function, we, you need to be a little bit careful. You shouldn't just optimize greedily for yourself. Um, you should also think about how your motion impacts others. That way, by everybody optimizing a little bit selfishly and a little bit politely, you, you'll lead to what's in total a global better motion. Um, so we have a selfish component of the optimization, which is just the progress you're making towards a goal, and the polite component is basically how much your velocity is impacting others around you, which we can shortcut this by seeing how much you're being slowed down by your collision avoidance system. And we have this gamma that lets you balance the two. And it turns out it doesn't depend very strongly on what gamma you choose. So the kind of classic way for looking at a bandit problem is you use what's called upper confidence bounds. You look at your average reward, and you choose the arm that had the highest average reward with a special bonus to arms that you haven't tried a lot, because maybe you don't understand them well, because it's a stochastic system. Um, and what we expected to happen, what we hoped to happen, is if you think about this scenario, the robot would try going forward a little bit, realize that it got slowed down, tried going to the right a little bit, realize that it worked well, it's making progress towards its goal, and then keep going right, and eventually, once it gets past the congestion, reach its goal. So this is the theory. Um, in practice, this is what we got. So it's, it's not obviously better than TTC or base ORCA was. Um, yes, the agent eventually goes forward. 
Um, but this, there's nothing wrong with upper confidence bounds. The math is very solid, but it's a different assumption. The assumption is you're the only player. All of the slot machines in front of you, all of the decisions you're making, have some fixed distribution they're pulling out of, and you're just trying to understand what that is and optimize it. What happens in our domain is everybody's trying to optimize at the same time. So your velocity isn't just a choice, it's also a signal. If I have some velocity and you're planning around it, and I change that velocity on you, I'm invalidating your plan, and that's what you're seeing here. So what we struggled, what we tried to come up with is ways to change less often. We really wanted to decrease the rate at which you tried new strategies. Um, and this is what we thought about as context-dependent learning. Don't explore when you don't need to. And so there's a well-known meta heuristic called win, stay, lose, shift. And again, I think this is a high-level idea that's going to be useful in lots of areas. And this idea is, if it's going well, don't mess with it, don't rock the boat. Only if there's a problem do we try exploring. So if our velocity, if our progress is above a th certain threshold, we keep our velocity. If it drops below a threshold, then we explore using a UCB guided exploration. And here's this results there. A little bit of exploring, and then we find a valid velocity and we keep with it. Um, this is actually more robust than we were expecting it to be. So this is the kind of oncoming scenario. Um, we can see here, we can pause this for a second. Here on the left, there's a three-way intersection and the agents deflect to avoid interacting with each other. Uh, with small numbers of static obstacles, uh, we don't need a road map. With the large of the office evacuation, we would, but just a few obstacles in front of us, we can naturally deflect around those without problem. And the most interesting one here is the one in the center. Um, we, we reach a deadlock, but we have a politeness term, and eventually we realize that by one of us going backwards, at least I'm allowing my polite motion to happen, and it resolves the deadlock, so the agents are able to get out of the deadlock and make progress. So it really was kind of a, a, a very broadly applicable rule that really improves the amount of cooperation we're seeing amongst the agents, even though everybody's making selfish decisions. Um, and again, we can try this on real robots. Uh, so this gets a little more to your question. We actually, to put it, before we put on robots, we added two more um, two more aspects, one of which it was a new arm, a new kind of action we could take. Rather than just choosing a preferred velocity, which you could do, you could also choose an action of following somebody. So from time to time, you could try following someone, and this makes a lot of sense if somebody's going the same direction you are. Let's not avoid collisions, let's just follow them and they'll avoid collisions. And the second thing we did is, as you mentioned, we give deference to people who are closer to goals. So you get a priority if you're closer to a goal I'm going to only be polite to you. If you're closer to your goal than I am to my goal, I'm going to only be polite to you. And this gives us the ability to kind of better handle these highly constrained scenarios. So this tape on the ground here isn't taped to our robots, it's an impassable wall. So it's a very constrained scenario our robots are trying to get through, one to come in and two to go out. And you'll see the robot coming closest gets to the constraint first. These two go to the side, gives them the following behavior. And once the constraint is through, the robots then go. Again, all real time autonomous. It's completely sensing based, yeah. I have just a question. So, so sorry, to, to go back, there's like onboard cameras here. So they're using their onboard cameras. Uh, I, I should, should say they, they communicate with each other. So they have their estimation from the onboard cameras and the estimation from the um, map-based localization, but they're communicating with each other, so it's not completely distributed from that sense. Um, so if we compare this with the humans, if there is a lot of people coming and there's only one, he's going to wait, Yeah. The, which is not uh, the case right now, right? So the guy, single guy moved, and then, the, uh, so he's not very polite yet. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so what happens is that you're, you're not polite if you are... Yeah, but because we have the, this rule about only your, 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 so this isn't just the politeness, right? This is oh, something, go back, yeah, something beyond politeness. This is, you're completely deferential. This is a strong deference to people who are closer to the goal than you are, which is nice because it, we can mathematically approve, prove that it avoids chains, right? It, it, so as long as we're all consistent in our estimate over who's closer to their goals, which is another thing you have to communicate is where your goals are, we can avoid chains. 
Um, but so I don't think this rule is very human-like. It was chosen specifically because it allowed us to prove avoidance of change and deadlocks that way. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that it's not as satisfying as some of the earlier results where it looked as nice. I should just hack this, right? Move that guy back a little bit, and you never notice. <laughs> um, all right, so in general, you know, we, we made a lot of assumptions that we, we know a lot about the people around us. And uh, that's not normally the case. You know, if, if you're controlling the whole system of robots, that's maybe a good assumption to make. But often you're only controlling one robot in a larger ecosystem. And when you're, we're trying to think towards those options and what you can do in those situations. And so one of the things, one of the approaches that we've been trying is still to use this anticipatory or simulation-based planning where you simulate what's going to happen around you and you choose actions that are good for your expected simulation. But rather than making a single simulation, you use a basket of simulations. You use some sort of portfolio of different models that you might expect people to have. And if, because we're watching the behaviors of those around us, we can re-rate our portfolios based on what we see. So if I'm this agent alpha and I see my neighbor here, I can have two or three different models and one predicts he'll go forward and one predicts he goes right. Once I see that the agent goes right, I can update the weight I have for each of those models in order to kind of change my view of his likely behavior. So I can still use these techniques of prediction-driven simulation, but I'm going to be, you know, I don't have to know as much about the world. I'm going to learn it as I'm going forward. And this is really nice because it lets us adapt to an even wider class of, of navigation behavior. So we see what we're going to show you is the exact same scenario with the exact same code for our adaptive agent. But the, the first time, the agents are ORCA agents. So there's all this very nice, polite work, this mathematically guaranteed collision avoidance. And ORCA works well even if you don't cooperate with them. So our agent is going to end up exploiting that knowledge and just drive straight ahead. I've identified you as ORCA, my simulation, my, my receding horizon planner lets me go straight ahead and I don't have to do any work. But if we do the same simulation again with agents that don't respond at all, that are basically turned off to do anything except drive ahead, we correctly put them in that bin. And after maybe one time step where it takes us to realize that, we do the work ourselves. So by adapting to the world around you, you can do a better sense and you can get even more flexibility in how you're using your motion planning. OK. So. Classifying the other agents as either this or that? I think we have like six different navigation models. So, so I had, uh, um, yeah, this is uh, each color's navigation model here. The yellow agents are particularly um, avoidance of collision. And you can see our agent finds and exploits them and just runs straight at them knowing that they're going to get out of their way. Um, yeah, there's kind of a natural extension where you want to think about a continuum of models, right, rather than a discretization. It's just harder to optimize over that continuum. Okay, so I think I have maybe five, five ten minutes left, and I have some questions. So let me just talk really briefly about some of the really high-level stuff, about long-term planning. And, and I wanted to mention this uh, because so much of my thoughts here are driven around uncertainty, and I haven't had a chance to really talk about un uncertainty influences my work. Um, so let me shift gears away from agents for a second and think about farms and drones. Uh, this, this work was actually started working with a company called Farm Intelligence, and they, they wanted to plan a drone, or even teams of drones, that would fly around fields and try to observe the health of the field. And so again, it's in some sense a, a navigation problem, but the goal selection is now the challenge. We don't have to worry about how not to run into people. We have to worry about where we want to go in the first place. And I realize that this is a kind of an interesting opportunity to take advantage of uncertainty. We, instead of computing a gradient of your avoidance energy with respect to your controls, like we did in the differential drive TTC, we're going to compute a gradient of our uncertainty in the environment with respect to the controls. So this is a very difficult, it ends up you can't compute this exactly, you have to linearize it, or in, in fact we quadraticize this derivative. Um, and we, we start with an initial trajectory, and we use that quadratic derivative to give us a small update to the trajectory at each time step. This is based on a, uh, an LQG kind of approach, it's an iterative LQG or ILQG, where we start with some trajectory, and then we compute the derivative with respect to the uncertainty that the trajectory is going to have in the environment. And over time, we'll have a better and better trajectory. So 
if we think about the farm field surveillance, if we start with some state where the robot is right now, we show this camera frustum, the area that the robot can see or have seen for many frames, it has very low uncertainty about. And now it can compute the derivative of this uncertainty with respect to its controls, and it will be naturally pulled into higher, to the areas of high uncertainty, or at least the, the camera will, will be rotated to areas of higher uncertainty. And as we let this derivative evolve over time, we can see the robot will naturally observe the whole field. So, so we can use the same optimization-based framework to actually guide our agents, not just to avoid collisions, but to do the high-level planning. Um, and of course, we tried to push this to its limits to do more and more complex things. And this was my favorite example. So again, we have, this is a 2D robot, but it's a completely, um, it's a quadrotor dynamic. So the robot can only move in the direction that it's facing, the camera is fixed mounted on the bottom, it can only observe in the opposite direction from where it's moving. And there's a big wall here. Uh, and this wall is impassable, but there's a little window. So you can see through the window, but you can't pass through the window. And we have that same task, how can we observe the whole field? And we give it to our optimizer, and what the robot finds to do is it flies as close to the window as it can, and then as I'm flying away from the window, looking down, my camera can finally see through the window as I go off. Um, and I thought this was a really kind of smart solution, and it comes automatically from this gradient-based optimization formulation. So this red line here is the uncertainty, and you can see it's very it's kind of high right underneath the window where we couldn't see, and it's high far away, but we were able to see as deep into the scenario as possible. Um, I'm not an aerospace engineer, so I don't have access to, to good quadrotor flyers, but we tried this with a ground robot, so it was our differential driver robot again, and we've tasked it to get to the lab refrigerator, this is the robot's point of view, but while sensing as much as the back wall of our lab as possible. So you'll see as it drives through here, the robot automatically turns to sense this corner, and then comes back and drives to the refrigerator while keeping its camera kind of angled right to see the wall as it's going on. Right, so, so this kind of idea of thinking about your uncertainty and navigating all together is really where I think the future of robotics lies, especially from the point of view of this intelligence and the planning aspect. Um, so, so maybe I can just take two seconds to, to talk about where we're going with this right now. Our most recent uh, robotics paper was at uh, IROS in Madrid not too long ago, where we were thinking about very, very highly constrained scenarios. And if you're looking at uncertainty here, this can lead to problems because our robot here doesn't know what this human's going to do. And if we simulate forward a bunch of trajectories, we can go to the right or to the left. And these constraints make it, they make you want to not think about the uncertainty. They make you just want to choose one simulation and avoid that and hope you got it right and replan. And honestly, that's an okay strategy. Um, but you might notice something. You notice that the human can go left or right, but we can't do both, right? And if you can start thinking about how you can exploit that knowledge of humans, you might realize that we can cluster our paths. We can cluster the options. We can cluster the potentialities. So I, I kind of like to think of this as a, a multiple universe planning or a multi-world or branch planning, where our robot is going to make two plans, one if the person goes left and one if they go right. And what you can see here is the first several steps of the robot are the same regardless. And we only branch once we know we'll have enough information to know what they're doing. So we branch at the point where we expect to have some idea of what the future is. And so we have two plans that are coherent up to a point and branched after that. Um, and so, so maybe I'll, I'll leave people to read the paper, but the, the kind of two ideas you have to do to enable this are one, cluster your predictions. These uncertain predictions can be clustered based off of how cert when you're certain to know which of the two paths you're in. Um, and the second thing to do is when you're doing your optimization, you need to have a consistent optimization before or after you've identified a branch split. But what's nice about this is that it gives us more flexibility, and it's also in certain cases faster than non-branch planning because we've opened up kind of a new universe of possibilities. Okay, so, so let me back up. Really high level, I think there's three key takeaways for having your robots move well in this kind of messy dynamic world. One is that Try to use your knowledge of the world effectively. Try to understand how the world's going to work and exploit that knowledge of your expected future states. 
right? And, and the second kind of related point is don't just think about positions. Think about space time. Think about how the future is traveling and how my velocities will change in the future. And the last thing is don't be afraid of using uncertainty. Yes, it will make your world harder. It makes life more difficult. But by exploiting uncertainty intelligently and in a way that maybe is aware of the other two, you can do something despite of the high constraints that uncertainty puts on your motion planning. Okay, so I'll stop there. My web page is here. I'm around um, till, till I think 5.30 or 6.00 today if people want to talk more. But I really want to say thank you for having me again. Uh, yeah, so, so they, they work in stationary assumptions, right? Not dynamic. We know if, as you said yourself, or at least you implied it, if I'm by myself and I'm in front of the, uh, the jackpot machine, this works. But they, as far as I know, there have not been very successful extensions of multi arm but import problems for multi agent systems. Yeah, so, so the easier answer. Who knows what and what they want. Yeah, so the easy answer is we tried it because it's hard, right? And to the extent that we had a success, I'm happy about sharing it. But, but to. But so, so there's um, something called windowed UCB. And the idea is that you use a multi arm bandit over a small window. So if your situation is stationary over the course of a window, it is in some sense optimal as long as your window is targeted correctly. So the question we have is over what characteristic sizes is do you have a window that's exploitable? And if that is several seconds, that gives you many, many chances to update your, um, to, to explore, right? So this should, in theory, work in large, in large long-term enough scenarios where you have stability. So it's really a question of characterizing the stability region of your, of your simulation. No, no problem. What do you do when you have multi-plates with multi-arm multi bands? That's my question. Uh, yeah, so, so the, the wind stay loose shift, you, you want to make, you want the, so once you realize that the question is how often the world is stationary, you want to keep the world stationary as often as possible. Yeah? Uh, then you have problems with information, right? Who shares or who doesn't share? Who acts first, who acts second? Or no, so each person is optimizing individually. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing my own bandit. But the world is changing around me, right? Every time somebody else changes their preferred velocity, then my, my decision has changed, right? And I should, in some sense, refresh my slate of options. And we want to increase as much as possible the times between these refreshes by decreasing as frequently as possible how, how often people change their preferred velocity. Right, so what, you're absolutely right. What we have to do is get people to change as little as possible. And so in the situation where it works, it works because we're in a period of instability, and then we quickly reach a period of stability. So if we have one or two agents who run into local problems, it's going to work very well. If everybody is reset into mass chaos, it's going to run into exactly the kinds of situations you're, you're referring to. I don't need any more than two. The problem is that uh, somebody asked you the same question is, what do you do with the information? Who knows what and when they know it? Because to do what you said, I have to know that everybody else is doing to estimate my window. Well, is the information centrally shared then or what? No, each person is making an independent decision, right? So you don't know when you should be resetting, but you have to infer it from the observations you have, from the positions and velocities. I mean, yeah, you're right. So, so there's a philosophical question here about what do you do when you can't prove? And the approach we've taken, especially in that work, is a best effort kind of solution. We make an algorithm which would work under certain circumstances. We try to identify the circumstances where it's provable to work. And then we understand and characterize how well it works in the real world outside of those circumstances. But you're absolutely right that the proofs break down in the regimes that we're trying to algorithm. But yeah, I, that's, that's a very important observation. I guess the, the, I see the, is that uh, some kind of uh, pre field force control, right? Vector field control. Yeah, it's, yeah, you, you have a, I mean, it's a little bit, Function yeah, but because it's dependent on the position and velocities of my agents, not just, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this implies that you do not have constraints in your control, right? So, yes, we've tried some different things with constraints. Um, 
I don't have anything that will make you happy given that line of questions, but um, what we've had the most success in doing with constraints is you add a, a reward, a term to your reward, for the amounts that you're violating your constraints. And then after that, we put a hard cap on our constraints. So if you have a maximum velocity, we penalize your velocity for being high and then cut you off at some certain point. Um, I like this approach too, that uh, in terms of guaranteeing the, the collision avoidance, you, do, you cannot do without uh, unconstrained control, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So Once I have unconstrained control, OK, I cannot get past that. But do I have a prescribed time that I can reach a goal? or? Is it gonna, I mean, in a robot navigation uh, scenario? Um, it's an online system. So you're, you, you're just making progress to your goal. You don't have any time constraints. Eventually you yes, it's eventual progress. I, I should be clear. So here, we get everything we want. It's completely provably collision-free. But the cost for this is it's centralized. I have to plan explicitly over all robots simultaneously. And I can do this even with thousands of robots in a few milliseconds, maybe 100 milliseconds. Um, so if you're willing, it's not a computational bottleneck, it's a philosophical one. If you're willing to engage in a centralized system, computationally for the kind of scale of robots that we can manufacture and control these days, I can have guaranteed collision avoidance. But there's something philosophically unhappy about centralized controllers, even if they're practically possible. And, and that's why for, one millis for 100, 1,000 milliseconds, we could be collision free, because I'm choosing everybody's velocity, right? If I had to worry about somebody changing their speeds in the middle of my course, I couldn't do this. Yes, please. First of all, I, I like your talk. The question is for uncertainty. What kind of models do you use? Um, so we use a kind of a belief space model. So we represent the uncertainty so yeah, we represent the uncertainty as a, uh, a Gaussian distribution. So you have a, like if you're, or you're a three-dimensional position, your uncertainty ends up being six dimensions, right? An estimate of the mean x, y, z, and an estimate of the variance x, y, z. Um, so we've used slightly different things in the different um, approaches. The, the very last thing I showed with the split world planning, it's a mixture of Gaussian model. And our clustering is over the Gaussian mixtures. But when you're trying to do the ILQG optimization, you, you we, we're, we're computing this quadratization, and computing the quadratization over the mixture of Gaussians leads to some complications that you can avoid if you just have a single Gaussian. Uh, the question I always ask is, do you have not enough data to support this hypothesis, or you would do better if you go deterministic uncertainty models, like set values and things like this? Yeah, that's, that's actually a very interesting question. In the case of um, studying humans, right, we mentioned, I mentioned this, um, uh, uncertainty-based uh, accuracy model, where I try to figure out um, whether or not your simulation is matching what real humans did in the scenario. Uh, I ran a kalmogorov smirnov test for the normality. And even for one agent for one time step, it's incredibly normal, right? Our p-values are, are, are vanishing close to zero. Um, so that gives me some confidence that in these small scenarios, but for robots, it's much harder to get data. I can't just let thousands of robots run the same way I can get unlimited amounts of surveillance data for people. So I can't as strongly answer that question in the robot practice as I can. But to the extent I'm trying to follow the theme of deriving these things from people, there's a lot of evidence that the Gaussian assumption, while not correct, is, is informative, why there is some true Gaussianness to the error of the motion people take. The question is, do you need that? So you can go totally empirical in this idea. Yeah, I know a lot of my colleagues like to think about just hard constraints, right? I'm going to have some extra radius. I think this may be what you're suggesting. And I'm going to cut as close as I can to that extra radius. And I think the biggest advantage there is that it lets you have these proofs, these formal guarantees of correctness. Um, yeah, I don't, have a, I don't have a great answer for you as to what the advantages are. The Gaussian opens up some new kinds of optimization potentials because we can have smooth functions to take gradients over where hard constraints wouldn't. In the end of the day, that trade-off, I'm not sure I can say which is the right approach, though. But it does let us have this, at least it's one way to have a completely integrated framework where everything is smooth and Gaussian, and we can find the true optimum in this approximation. And now you can argue that if our approximation is bad, the true optimum isn't important. But to the extent that we're working in fields where it does match, it's nice to know we have a completely integrated system. But uh, yeah, I have lots of conversations like this with uh, the other roboticists in Minnesota who 
you know, uh, you, you really do start to lose some, on some proofs here and in some domains that proofs of correctness are important. And like we talked about with ORCA, there's a trade-off for those proofs of correctness. And that sometimes uh, often will be progress to a goal. We can be mathematically correct. We can have proofs of, proof of correctness in the approval framework even with a totally empirical data. Okay. I can prove things even when I, in, if I go back to your bandit formulation, to have results of proofs of optimality even if I do not know the functional form of the reward functions. It's just what I observe. Yes, yes. What I'm saying is if I'm trying to prove guaranteed of collision freeness, then I might lose on uh, uh, progress towards the goal. So I might progress towards the goal. So I have a robot, and I want to have uh, mathematical guarantees that I have no collisions. So I switch to a, um, a radius space formulation. What do I do with my radii overlapping? I can't take a step, right? So there needs to be something you do when there's, no, when there's nothing you can do. I mean, be wise randomize, right? To, 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 to go even one step. It's better than Wednesday lose shift is be wise randomize. I like that. <laughs> You do that all the time yourself. If you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you go out the corridor and somebody's pushing a, a, a carriage, you have to decide this time when you go left or right. Yeah. I, yeah. You don't have any reason for this. Yeah. yeah, you do run into a metastability problem of knowing whether or not you're in a situation where you should be randomizing or you should be optimizing, right? But yeah, you're absolutely right. You should be wise and randomize. I think that's, that's, that is absolutely correct. Any other questions? One more. <laughs> yes, please, thank you. This uncertainty modeling with the uh, ILTG and all that stuff that connects to navigation functions. And can I connect navigation functions in the various forms with other plannings that you discussed today? Yeah, so, so this is the same kind of answer I was saying before. Is you just need to be a little bit careful because it's a velocity based formulation, right? Because your velocity affects my decision, some of the forms that have been used for optimizing over these functions aren't always applicable. So just when you're applying some, some navigation of gradient, it's not completely positional dependent. It's not safe to try to estimate your velocity? No, I'm saying my, my decision depends on the velocity of my neighbors around me. Right, right. But I mean, if you drive a car, right? Yeah. All the time in your brain, you calculate some sort of velocity, however approximate it is. Otherwise, you can drive. Yes, yes. Especially when you drive to pass. So, is that enough? I can do the same thing here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what we do. Um, I'm just saying, so when you say navigation functions, there's, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so we approximate the velocities. I'm just saying when you're optimizing, you can't optimize as a function of, of purely positions. There, there's, a, like, there's a chain rule that happens, right? I have to figure out the derivative with respect to, yeah. Thank you. No, that was a great discussion. Thank you. Um, but yeah, definitely email me. Uh, I'm, I'm like super happy to talk more about all of these things. So, thank you guys. Thank you.